Your identity, a unique life form placed on Earth for a single purpose, to be free to share your gift with the world. And when someone tells you to be yourself, you struggle to know who you are. An internal war wages between the image you've been portraying and your true self. A battle that, up until now, you've been losing. But what if there was a way to uncover your true identity? To turn the tide on this conflict and learn to find and embrace the real you. To help you on your gifted path, your next set of remarkable masters are waiting. A global speaker who inspired the Canadian Olympic team and the Pentagon. A founder of a global institute that is elevating humanity's creative capability. And an elite mindset performance coach, the builder of world champions, who's worked with Bono from U2 and Tiger Woods, who will all help you answer the question, how do I free the real me within? All three of you um, have been a guide and a mentor to me on my own transformational journey uh and and that's why i invited the three of you together because i i want to kick off by sharing my immense gratitude for how much direction and guidance and leadership the three of you individually have given to me uh in different ways and this is my dream come true to have all three of you here together uh and i i'm i'm so excited to see what unfolds today and one of the through lines that I see for each of you is that you each help people deal with their bullshit in some capacity. Uh, all three of you help super high performing people deal with their bullshit. Like I know Jeff and Philip work with professional athletes. All three of you work with super high functioning, successful entrepreneurs. And part of what I want to uncover today is that I, I in helping a lot of people myself, there's this um, phrase that has come up that it's very hard to read the label of the jar you're in. And I think people have a big struggle identifying what their, either their programming is or beliefs that aren't serving them. And I want to figure this out. Like I really want to help create transformations for people to either, and I don't know if this is the right phrase to use, but become their best self or the best versions of themselves or, or reach their potential or create the biggest possible impact that they can. And I wanna start that as a frame for our conversation today. Um, and I know that we all help people in this way. So Philip, I'll, I'll start with you because um, you've been a game changer for me. Uh, I've been to a bunch of your events, I've spoken at your event. Uh, and then I, I went to your Ireland retreat, Brave Soul, in 2015. And for me, that year was one of the most pivotal years of my own transformation. And uh, in this whole journey, the thing I've struggled with the most is the phrase, be yourself. So when someone says, be yourself, what does that mean for you? Or what does that phrase mean? Well, you won't find it on my website, not because <laughs> I don't believe, uh, I don't believe it exists. Um, somebody once said to me, the worst advice you can give anybody when they're about to get on stage, whatever the stage is, particularly in a speaking context, is be yourself. And I'd say most of us have no idea what that is, and we have no idea who we are, yet we hold on to these stories. And very quickly, I think, you know, I remember the first time I went for therapy, and I wasn't going because I needed it. I was going because I was way too cool, but I was going because I was just curious, and I wanted to be able to check that box and to be able to talk about it with some authority, but at the same time, even though I wasn't conscious of it, my intention was to go into that room and kind of hide and bullshit, essentially. And I came out of that room an hour later. Uh, very quickly, there was a box of Kleenex, the biggest box of Kleenex I'd ever seen in my life. And all the gentleman did is said, tell me a bit about yourself. And I'd say it took me about two and a half minutes before I was bawling my eyes out, which was quickly replaced by rage, back to sadness, tears, rage, sadness. And it continued for an hour until he said, our time is up, which I said, fuck you. I said, I'm just getting started. And I left that room and I was so scared at what I had uncovered or what we had uncovered. To you. I was so scared. And in that moment, I realized I had no idea who I was. I had a perception of who I thought I was, 
but I had no idea what had happened to me, what I'd done in the world that had created all of that emotion. And it wasn't until I started and continue to work in that progress do I begin to understand who I am. So I don't think we ever get to fully know who we are. And therefore, I believe that advice can be flawed at a fundamental level. Can be. It's, it's a statement I've never resonated with, partially because I think we are constantly evolving. And, and even more because I believe that we can change and that, you know, um, we are sort of the main character of our story, but we're also the narrator and we're also the author of the story. And as we evolve and grow and, and move forward in our journeys, we can change the story in a way that makes sense and we can acquire skills and we can uh, change habits and we can change ourselves. And that's why I've always struggled with this. Jeff, what about you? What, what, um, you teach the concept of going from um, a human mindset to a champion mindset. What does the champion version of a person look like? Well, I think a couple of things here is that you know, to piggyback on what you just said there, I think there's, a, there's an observer, us, that's objectively watching the war within us between our champion's self and our human uh, self, our human self, I call it a human mindset. It's those things that are biologically programmed into us first and foremost, and then they can be reinforced by the environment that we find ourselves in, and we can start to believe those stories. But there is a biology that sets us up for it that I don't think is given enough credit. Uh, the reason why I say there's a champion side to us is because I've never, I've never met a person that could wait to get up and fail. I've never seen that in my entire life. So I know that there's a, a quest and a, a spawning instinct for us to create a life of value and contribution as well. And the, there's us, the action taker. So I, I think what's most important is that the reactive side of ourselves, that person that says the things that we certainly did say that maybe broke a relationship forever, and we looked at who was that person. Well, I think that's a good question. It was probably our fear-based survival instinct side, our human mindset responding faster than we could think. And there has to be a biology that's faster than we could think. I mean, everybody thinks neuroscience is everything. Well, it's, it's something, but it's not everything because there is a high-speed response to life that's faster than we could think. I mean, our hand knows where to put itself to break a fall something comes out of our mouth faster than we can think it. If you look at all those things, it's a survival mechanism. And those things don't do us well because you can't create a life of, of excellence and you cannot tease out your greatest gifts and make that your life platform if you're responding to life through those you know, survival uh, reflexes that we have biologically built into us. And so I, it's, a, it's a journey constantly of looking at history and what does history tell us about if we take what action will deliver on a promise of moving forward towards a manifestation of what our greatest gifts are. And to me, uh, as you said, that's an evolutionary process over time that, that's continuously unfolding. But I think the biggest take home here, at least to start with, is to say that you know, the side of us that represents uh, those actions that contribute to humanity and advance us uh, towards our contribution towards that, as far as manifesting our gifts, you know, in tangible form, the things that we say, the things that we do, the things that we create, um, you know, those things that create that have to be applied to be maintained. Uh, if we don't maintain them through their application, then we always drift back to that fundamental human mindset us that we didn't ask for that keeps us in survival. And if we're in survival, at the very best, we can only repeat history. Usually on the doubt side, there's no way that we can possibly make it. So I think that when we understand that there are sort of multiple parts to the equation that's in a continuous state of evolution, then we can start to wrap our brains uh, around who we are at that moment in time and make decisions about who it is that, in what place and what mind or mindset that we choose to come from each and every moment of our life. On that topic, we all have uh, an image of our identity, of who we believe ourselves to be. And it doesn't seem to, it seems to be, have, it seems that it has been given to us by other people or by environment. And uh, Neil, in your um, working with people, where do we get this, where do we get our original identity from? Well, in its simplest terms, you know, I think for the most part, what happens is, you know, we're, we're born into the world and immediately we go from a, a, a place of being in a warm, liquid, insulated environment into the shock of existence. And so we're plummeted into, uh, an extraordinary situation of response and react and 
largely what happens, I think, is we begin to pretzel and mould and shape ourselves entirely uh, as an attempt to survive childhood. We are observing, reacting to what's happening, responding to what's happening in our lives. We begin to acquire a vocabulary. As we build a vocabulary, it becomes the means of verbally expressing ourselves. We start to look at the people that, that have an emotional connection and emotional impact on us, and we start to model our physicality, um, our biomechanics, you know, to emulate those people. Um, for the most part, we assemble a character. And uh, I'm of the view that a lot of times when people say be yourself, in essence what they're saying is, you know, be the best version of the identity that you've constructed. The reality of it is if we were to be a little more accurate, I think the only way of representing that word of yourself would be for it to be two words, your and self would be a capital S. <clears throat> of which we have no idea what that is we're talking you know i think that's the great cosmic joke you know let's take the infinite power of the entire creation of all that exists and just for the heck of it let's put it inside a sausage that's got bones and and see what it can do with it and to some degree what happens is some of the infinite power of the self seeps through and you know we see people who do extraordinary things and create extraordinary things but by and large the being component of human being is more often than not the, the, the lesser expressed part of who we are and the human part of human being is the, the most part of what people get. Uh, I, I think that people like yourself and Philip and Jeff, you know, there's a world of great coaches that have that ability to be able to interact with people's identity and just open the door enough to allow more of that self to seep in to who it is that they are. And very often people find a way of being able to create a connection channel to that and, and be able to bring that to the world. But of course, what gets in the way of that by and large is the, the design of the species where we, uh, we have an identity and Whilst I think that there's an extraordinary complexity to that identity, I think that the actual architecture of it and the mechanics of it are deceptively simple. Well, the majority. The, uh, typically, what happens for us is that well, let's just go to, to 101, what, what, we, what we know. We, we know that we're born, that, we, that things happen to us, we have experiences, typically experiences that ha have a high emotional, we have a higher emotional response to, become more bonded in our, in our memory, particularly those where the high emotional response is a negative response. That's a very, very high emotional energy. It triggers an enormous amount of neurochemistry. That neurochemistry has a particular quality to it. I tend to conceptualise it and say, you know, it, it burns very, very deep neural pathways. It's very corrosive. It's very acidic. Um, unfortunately, it's also highly addictive. What happens when we have these experiences is that, you know, the brain by design, if we were to simplify its role, it, it is, it really has one role. It's keep us alive. And there's two components to that. In the moment, make sure that the extraordinary complex functionality is occurring. And secondly, protect us from any future threat. So it's, it's sort of like um, a, a maintenance as well as a protector. When we have experiences as children, particularly those that we interpret as negative, bad, unpleasant, we experience that as, uh, as an unpleasant circumstance and the brain's response to that is let's protect you from that. And so how it protects us from that is it goes on guard, it goes on lookout for that situation uh, wanting to protect you from it reoccurring. I draw the analogy of, you know, if a child was walking down the street and a dog ran out from behind a car and it, you know, bit up the child by the leg, and there was a traumatic experience from the child, I can guarantee you that every time that child walks down the street, it will be on guard looking for a dog to jump out from behind the car. And what happens in those situations is that when we are on guard, with brain doing what it's designed to do, protect us from circumstance. What happens is that it's triggering the same neurochemistry as the actual incident itself. Not to the same degree, but it, it actually ensures the persistence of that chemistry. And so what happens is when we're very young, while our body's in a state of growth, our vocabulary's in a state of growth, our neurology's in a state of growth, we have this persistence of this neurochemistry uh, that the body comes to believe that is normal 
in order to maintain homeostasis. It's, it's, it's normalized because it's there all the time. And uh, we develop an addiction to that. And uh, what happens, of course, as we get older is that addiction doesn't function at the level of want, it functions at the level of the need. And so we tend to orchestrate a life of circumstances and situations and relationships that guarantee the persistence of that chemistry. Well, in all of that, in order to maintain that structure, it does require an enormous component of the identity that we've structured and very little of the self, very little of capital S self. You, you mentioned trauma. Um, and one of the things that Philip taught me in 2015, and I want to make sure I get the phrase right, is that you said your gift is next to your wound. Am I saying it right? And yeah, I think your gift lies right next to your deepest wound or next to your deepest wound. Or, yeah. The pattern, ever since you said that to me, the pattern I've seen emerge is that often people's vocation or path or journey or, or the work they want to do or the help they want to do with other people is directly connected to the pain they've experienced. So can you share more about the how to, how to uncover a gift based on, on, on the painful experiences you've been on? I, I, I think sometimes I believe, you know, chasing the gift is is perhaps the very thing that, you know, runs away from us. So so pursuing the gift with aggression may not actually be the best thing. I'll give you an example of a lady who who contacted me. I'd worked I'd done some work with her and she contacted me out of the blue and she said, Can I get fifteen minutes of your time? And as probably all of us in this call realize, fifteen minutes is never really fifteen minutes. And she says, I have an upcoming talk I want, I'm want. i doing and I've been invited to do, and I'd love to put the talk by you and just get a sense of what you think of the frame of it. And um, I, I know her, so I'm quite sarcastic. It's it's not just because I'm Irish, but I'm pretty sarcastic, which sometimes uh, people misinterpret as not caring. Um, but anyway, she gets on the call and she walks me through this talk, and it's all about you know traditional goal setting and all this kind of stuff. And and, and she, she said, this is the outline. What do you think? And I said, oh, my God, I've just I've got goosebumps all over. And she knew what I'm like. And she said, you're such an asshole. And I said, I said, I said, let's just call her Mary. I said, Mary, come on. I said, really? The best you can do is goal setting, you know, based on who you are as a person, based on the story you've lived, based on the traumas you've had, based on the magnificent things you brought into this world. And I just asked her a really simple question. I said, what subject could you simply not speak about without falling apart and perhaps like bawling your eyes out and without missing a single beat? She didn't even have to breathe in to find the oxygen for the word. She just went bullying. And I made, I, I was wrong. I made a natural assumption, uh, an incorrect one. I said, you were bullied. And she said, no, I was the bully. And I'm telling you one thing. If you paid me $1,000 uh, and, and asked me to guess and give me five guesses in the room that I originally met this woman in, there's no way I would have picked her. She's, she's petite. She's small. She's gentle. She's this. And I said, how bad was it? She said, it was, it was really bad. And I said, she said, Philip, I, I, I'd, I'd cry. I said, well, cool. If that's what motion is invoked in you and, 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 and emerges in you, that's fine. And she just could not believe that I was inadvertently suggesting, which I didn't really, I, but suggesting that she would speak about the very thing that she has enormous shame about. Like just tremendous, debilitating shame and guilt. And we know a lot about guilt in Ireland. We invented Guinness, we've invented rain, and we invented guilt. Don't try to take that from us. That's what we've invented in this country. And long story short, she goes to this event. It's a small, like 10 people, but it was like a teacher training or a speaker training thing. And she said, she rang me back and she said, I cried. And I said, okay. And she said, they all cried. And I said, okay. She said, no, all of them, everyone. She said, I got a standing ovation by these seven or eight or 10 people. And then it led, she had more speaking events in the following eight weeks than I had lined up for the next two years. And what I mean by that is because she shared such a deep part of herself, they, she just, it was so cathartic. It was so freeing. She brought it out of herself. She, she shone a light on the shame. And before you know it, she's going, not just did I allow it out, let it go to some extent, it actually has value and it can move others. 
She got speaking events all over northern Alberta and maybe other provinces in Canada, I don't know. And she went into schools and it was the first time they had a speaker who was willing to come in and put their hand up and say, I was the bully. So it's often the things that we're deeply ashamed about aren't necessarily directly the gift, but they can be the gateway to free us into the places that we're meant to show up in the world. I, I, I think we, we talk about the gift as if it's a kangaroo behind a bush in the outback in Australia. And that it's a singular thing that, you know, I, I like to think about, imagine, I, I like to think about life like a, a stepping stones, that there's a bank of the river we're on. And the other side of the bank is not perfection. It's just a better place. It's a place of peace. It's a place of a bit more serenity. It's a place of a bit more acceptance. It's a place where we become a little bit more what we feel like ourselves. And I, I think we've lost this idea of experimentation to some extent, whereby, no, no, I've got to find my gift before I, I, I emerge into the world. I've got to find my gift before I write my book. I've got to find my gift. And I just go, well, why don't we just take a step? Because the gift is not the step. The gift is the progress, the, 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 the journey to the other side. And often it's not, I often say this, and I've said this more recently for some reason, but when we're getting very close to something important that is emerging, like it's coming, and we cannot stop it, it's often the very time we build an extension in our home, buy a puppy or have a baby. And I don't mean that to come across as sexist in any respect. I, there's nothing wrong with having a baby. There's nothing wrong with building an extension. There's nothing wrong with buying a puppy, except when we're trying to fill a gap because of the emergence of something very deep within us. And I literally said that at a workshop not that long. Well, actually, it is long ago because of COVID, but I, maybe a couple of years ago. And some woman says, oh, my God, I just decided to extend my house. And I don't want to do that because I don't even want to be there. I don't even like the city I'm living in. And that's what we do. We create distractions so the gift doesn't get a chance to emerge into the world. You know, if I could say something here, I think there's an interesting thing about this, the gift side of this, is that a lot of people feel like, well, my gift, it's, uh, it comes so naturally, it must not be significant, and who would care? You know, we have a tendency to dismiss it, or, or sometimes people feel guilty about their gift because somehow they feel like it's a shortcut, and there are some people out there in the world that say you're sort of cheating because you got a gift, right? And so you don't, you shouldn't have the fair advantage because of that, or people perceive that and they stay away from it. So I think this idea gift, which is really the reason why we're here on this planet, I think, is to be able to manifest our gift. I mean, that's what showcases our uniqueness. I mean, you think about it, there's 7 billion people, 7.5 billion people on this planet right now, and there's only one of us, and we have this unique capacity uh, that's not only our innate gifts and talents, but it's also nobody has our history that allows us to make this unique stamp on humanity for all of eternity, and yet it's the very thing that sometimes we discount the most. And I, I found also that human nature has a tendency to believe in its ability to fail more than it does in its ability to succeed. So you got to fight that boogeyman as well. So there's all sorts of traps that I see that uh, kind of insulate us from uh, being able to step into the exploration of what those gifts really are. I mean, what do you guys think about that? Is it, Jeff, I think you're bang on. I, I, I think it's, sorry, Neil, go ahead. Yeah, there's a cultural dimension of that too, that, uh, that well-intended advice, parental advice often of, uh, of Let's educate yourself, make a decision about what your path will be and, and pursue that path. My experience has been that, one, can you listen long enough and can you listen quietly enough to hear what you're being called to do? The, the problem with that statement is that it does... I, I don't mean to imply that, that it's they're speaking clearly enough for you to be able to just hear what it is and follow that pathway. It seems to me more to be more authentic for people. Like, like the best thing you can do at the moment is just take a step. And when you experience that step at some point of time, it'll continue to feel like it's, it was the right step to take or it may not. And if it, if it feels like it's, you need to change, you take a step in a different direction and feel, look and see where you're being called to in that moment and hang out there. And for as long as it feels like that's the right direction, continue to hang out there. And if it doesn't, hold on and look around and see what, it might, what might, might be the next step. So very often what happens is that, that it can be a more ex authentic expression of, of life if we're putting together a jigsaw puzzle, not necessarily even knowing what the whole picture will look like, but being willing to take that step 
regardless of your fear, regardless of your story, regardless of your anxiety, and trust that ultimately there's divine design behind this. We are in partnership with a, a far greater intelligence than our identity has any capability of truly grasping. I have another thing I'd like to say, if I could, is that I think there's a, another misconception out here. People think they've got to get organized before they start. I think you take action to get organized. If you look at biology, you know, the way you get fit is to do something, right? You challenge the body and the body builds itself back up to a higher level of function. And I feel like and see people uh, almost paralyzed. You know, what am I going to do first? I've got to get organized. I, I don't think you do. I think you need to start first, and that tells you what the organization is, and that's how you move forward. It's kind of like an accelerator. I, I love what you said there, Neil, about the partnership. I think if we could all see that we're, we are in partnership with some divine entity or energy or, or being whatever your beliefs are, I think then you don't feel you're on your own in this world. Uh, I think sometimes people feel that when I make this step, I might fail, therefore I might look bad. And it's a lot of this about I. And I just want to go back to, to Jeff's point. I just love what he said about this, this idea, but we often don't put a value on our gifts. And I remember sitting with a, a gentleman called Tucker Max, which we've all met or know of and love him, hate him, whatever your spectrum is. Um, you know, he, he is a bit nuts and he, he's out there and, and, and I love him for that. And he said to me one day, I was sitting in front of him and he was interviewing me and, and I, I felt like such a fraud suddenly. I just this overwhelming sense of being an absolute and utter fraud because he was asking me about stuff that I was actually expecting him. I, I got this feeling that he was expecting me to reach over and pull out this little drawer with a lock on it and take out this gold dust and go boom. And he was going to go, what's that? And I go, and that's my secret recipe that's been handed down through the generations for hundreds and hundreds of years. And, and he goes, oh, I want that. I want, I want to know what that is. And I said, Tucker, that doesn't exist. And he leaned over and he said to me, and if he ever listens to this in the future, there's very few Tucker's, things Tucker's actually said that make sense. But anyway, this is one of them. Um, I, I give him a hard time. And he said to me, has anyone ever said to you, you're a good breather? And I went, what are, you, what are you talking about? And he said, you do what you do so naturally that you, don't, you can't even see the value in it, that you feel you need to be going for the secret sauce, for the gold dust, the multi-generational thing or whatever. And I think Jeff has, has nailed it. Is for most people, they can't, they're looking for something that's more complex. They're looking for, it, no, no, it has to be, it has to be something different. And yet it's often the very thing that lies right at our fingertips, right at the end of our nose, or just one inch above the surface. And we find it hard to identify that, never mind putting a monetary value or any type of value in the world. But I think Jeff's point on that is, is, is absolutely spot on. Neil used the word calling, which I love the word. And in my own journey, uh, Prior to what I'm doing now, I was doing other things. Like I was in the real estate space and um, I, I did really well and I secretly hated it and I was anxious and depressed because it just didn't feel aligned with me. And yet then I found, uh, I looked for the clues and I discovered that th this work with Archangel, with, with the people in our community, with who I surround myself with, this is what I love to do. And by discovering this, looking back through my whole life, the the what I would call the Easter eggs, like the clues kind of were always there for me to, to uncover. And I love my life now, which is awesome. And I wish this on everybody, but I feel like a lot of people are where I used to be, where they're doing work that doesn't fulfill them, doesn't really have meaning. And maybe it's because they need or want a paycheck or it's what they fell into. How does someone identify uh, these challenges or at least become conscious of them? I, um, look, this, the, I have a relationship with music that according to my parents was really evident from infancy. And from as long, for as long as I can remember, I always felt like I belonged to music. I'll, there's more to say about that, but I'll leave that part of it at that. Uh, as is the case in most countries for people that are artistic and are looking for artistic expression there are oftentimes fewer opportunities to monetize that and build a the type of career that would ordinarily be considered you know financially lucrative 
the urge for me to to express myself musically and for that to build a life around that was deep. I, but I ignored that. Uh, I came from a family, you know, my family were self-employed and um, there's five kids in our family. None of us went to college. For us, every, all of us got into business at a young age. I, I got into the restaurant industry. I owned restaurants and I was really good at it. And uh, I learned very, very early on in the piece that people were far hungrier for recognition than food. And I understood the mechanics of that and I built my business around the relationships that we established with people. And uh, that very quickly translated into a successful business. But I, w I was in my early 20s. I was way too self-impressed. You know, I had a, a business that was known, uh, you know, I'm going back 40 plus years. I'm driving a you know, $100,000 car 40 years ago in a beautiful home in a prestigious street. And I just thought I was so it. Um, but I was really deeply unsatisfied. And for me, it's a, it's a strange paradox to be successful and deeply unsatisfied. And I didn't really have any insights to how to reconcile that. The, the intention for me was get into business, do well enough so I can accumulate enough capital, enough cash, so I can retire and do music. I didn't even know what do music meant. I just knew that that's, I belonged to it and, and that's what I needed to do. Uh, and so at that time, this feeling of, of un dissatisfaction, it's like, okay, what do I do? I should be, I should be satisfied. I've got a successful business, a beautiful wife. I've got all the trappings that, that you know, we think represent success, beautiful clothes, gorgeous car, all of that stuff. I've got beautiful children. I should be satisfied, but I'm not. Maybe I should get another restaurant, which is what I did. <clears throat> I was pursuing that path. But this yearning to do music never left me. Uh, after the stock market crash in 89 here in the US hit Australia, I'd made a terrible business decision and uh, we went through a complete financial wipeout, total, total financial wipeout, bankruptcy. I, unlike the United States, I don't know how it is in Canada, but in Australia, if you go bankrupt, you, they take everything. You, you, you keep nothing. And uh, I was just like flat broke. And uh, like flat broke, I remember, you know, opening the fridge one day with my three kids standing there and just nothing in the fridge and going out to a pawn shop and selling my wedding jewelry to get money to buy food for the kids. Um, I remember one day I came home, I'd, I'd been out somewhere, and uh, w homes in Australia are uh, often sold by public auction. They put this big board outside your home with photos of the inside and it's announcement, public auction, and there's you know, the information about the house and the features and you can call the agent for an inspection. But on the day of the auction, they hold this public auction and people all come outside in the street and you know, it's auctioned off. There was this particular day where they were putting up the board to sell our home and the truck was there to take away our cars and I just had this moment, this realisation of, wow, they're taking everything I have, but they're taking nothing of who I am. And it was a visceral experience. It was like this crucible moment where I just experienced in that moment that I was completely whole and complete. And in that moment of experiencing that, I just saw my previous life as this simple equation. It's like, oh, shit, I've been pursuing business to earn money to do what I love. I will never do that again from this day forward. I'm gonna do what I believe I was called to do. I'm gonna pursue my love and my passion and I'm just gonna trust that if I'm on that right path, I will definitely need for some miracles to happen. I'm gonna trust that they will occur and a pathway will unfold itself. Which I had miracles happen after that decision was made. There were real practical things. I'm living in Australia. I've got a wife, three children, all the, the, the personal and financial responsibilities. I'm flat broke. I don't have any income. And I'm, I'm saying I'm just going to pursue music as a profession. It was, it was culturally, a, there was a stupidity to that. But for me, there was an absolute clarity to it. Now, your question of how do you know, I, I, it wasn't something that I worked my way to, Giovanni. It wasn't something that I intellectualized myself to. I think what happened for me, and I don't care whether this is true or not, I just get value in believing that it's true. For me, it was like I was being called to do that. I wasn't listening. And so it's like God was saying, okay, I'm going to dial up the volume on this calling. And in the end, okay, do I have to collapse your world around you? Is that what it's going to take, that big an incident, for me to try to give you the opportunity to, to do that reset and listen to what you're being called to do? That's what it took for me. 
and maybe it happens more naturally and more easily and more organically for others, but I don't have any formula as to how you find it. But I do believe that in the absence of you listening long enough and quietly enough, it's going to be very difficult to find that. And secondly, if that pursuit terrifies you, if you're scared of that, if the environmental and cultural consequences of that that you imagine thwart you, well, then that will absolutely get in the way of you discovering what you're being called to do. Yeah. Gio, can I ask you a question based on what Neil said? I, I, I loved what you said, and I believe wholeheartedly in the piece around, you know, the universe, God, you know, somebody's just, they're going to keep hitting you, hitting you, hitting you, and then they're going to take out the sledgehammer. And, and you were very kind and very complimentary of obviously the, the other guys on the call and, and, and some work that we've done together, et cetera. And while I appreciate that, I, I think it's amazing that you chose to step in and, and pursue that work and that exploration. So you're, you're the hero, really, I suppose, in the story. Was there a moment? Was there a, a series of moments similar to Neil's um, that you finally just were exhausted of yourself, the story, the narrative? I'm just curious. Yeah, a lot, a lot of it happened. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a few things that happened that were pivotal moments. Um, in 2008, uh, when my marriage failed, and I went to this deep, dark place and was very beyond depressed, uh, contemplating suicide. Um, and I had this experience. I, I, I was sitting in a Quiznos, like a uh, restaurant in Toronto. It was March 27, 2008. I still remember the date. Thinking, do I end my life kind of thing. It was just, I, I felt like I had zero hope and zero worth. Um, and my son at the time was three years old and he was the, the sort of reason I thought I can't, I cannot do that to him. And that same day I had to produce an event for a client. My client was Sony pictures, uh, the movie company, and they used to hire me to produce events to promote their upcoming new movies. So we had this nightclub rented and I thought, okay, you know what? For the first time in my life, I'm going to get drunk. I've never been drunk ever. Um, and I thought that's the night I'm going to just go to the bar and like, it's my party. I have unlimited access to alcohol. I just don't give a shit. And I was at the bar and I'm about to order the first drink and I feel a tap on my shoulder and I turn around and there's this woman, um, with this giant smile. I didn't know her. And she said, I heard this is your party. Um, are you Giovanni? And we just had the most amazing conversation. Uh, her name was Brandis and we became friends after that. And I, we've lost touch, but I thought this person is an angel. She literally saved my life. And I don't even know if she knows. Uh, and, and that was the, the first sort of turning point. And then um, after that, I got into real estate. And I did it because I thought I need to make money. I need to pay bills. And I'm good at marketing, so I'm going to do this thing. And I got better and better at the real estate thing, but it was never aligned. And I always did it for the financial reason. And then I got trapped because I started winning all these awards and I was, uh, I was featured in magazines and um, doing well, but then the pain kept getting worse and worse and worse. And it I was still unconscious. I didn't understand it. And then I thought it was so weird. To, how do you explain to people that you are quote unquote successful and you don't like it? I thought that what, a, how, like, this is so stupid, uh, but it allowed me the success in that world allowed me to start investing in myself and joining mastermind groups and uh, going to conferences. And uh, it's like where I met Neil, where I met um, the three of you. And then I started th this Archangel project as a side thing during real estate in 2014. And the analogy I gave uh, to someone in that 2015 pivotal year was real estate was my marriage of convenience and Archangel was my soulmate. And the, seeing the difference was so painful that I had to quit the real estate. And when I did that in 2016, I dropped 70 pounds, uh, met Stephanie, uh, who's now my fiance, created our first big event and everything took off from that moment. And it felt like I was getting out of jail. Like it just felt this new kind of freedom. And that was um, six months after my, your Ireland retreat. And I feel like that that retreat was so pivotal because it gave me 10 days by myself to think, which I, I had never done before. I was always, it was working, you know, 24 hours a day, every day, not taking a day off and not unplugging not, and giving my chance, uh, giving myself a chance to actually ask the right questions, which is something. So I'm very grateful for you to knock me over the head with the right questions. 
and then that's that was the chain of events that led to where we are now yeah my space was a little bit different you know i always had this a sense of where to be when and i was fearless about engaging the things that called me to it and uh it, it's sort of an odd situation because um when you know how your truth speaks to you and you get better at that then when things show up, it's much easier to embrace those things. And I was pretty fearless about giving everything I had to whatever it was that I was called to. Um, like that's how I made the Olympics. I feel like the Olympics uh, called me. I didn't, I guess I summoned it in a certain way, but uh, I did the same thing with my art career. You know, it was something that, that showed up at a certain point in time and I had a curiosity to explore it uh, that I just felt like I had an obligation to pursue it and see how far it could be developed over time. And that, has always worked really well for me. You know, I've never had these exhaustive long-term plans. I've always felt that those are like extraordinarily limiting, you know, for me, uh, anyhow. And um, I think a part of that is that, you know, some people may say that that's, you know, not being fully responsible. You got to be more objective and be more in the game. I, I think that's not exactly true. I think there's a way of being directly informed rather than being indirectly formed by pe people, places, or things about situations like that. And uh, what I've also discovered about that is that it takes a lot less time and effort and energy if that's your propulsion system rather than feeling like you have to show up and, and push too hard on something to try to make something happen. If you take the time to stand in receivership, which is a skill that you could learn, then that is a really important skill to be able to learn because as Philip said, sometimes when you try to pursue something, you're actually repelling it away from you. I, I think another side of this too that I've observed is that if it's a creative pursuit, um, sometimes it's important to have a side hustle or something that creates a financial base enough that you know how much time and effort it's going to take to maintain that enough to support the financial side, but it gives you space and time to not have a shotgun to your head to try to create. Because sometimes when you're under pressure in creation, you start to dry up and lock up because it becomes almost too, like, almost too important. So I think there's a couple of nuances in there that uh, you know are worth uh, considering. Well, uh, I think, again, there's two ways of looking at things. You can have an, I, when I say stand in receivership, that means put yourself in a conscious state of awareness to kind of turn your mind and your ambition off to be in pursuit, but perhaps to stand in silence, to stand under, to open yourself up in your conscious awareness to really invite opportunity to show up in your conscious awareness. Because, I mean, quite honestly, we don't give ourselves our own ideas. Our, our best creativity comes from a shower or something along those lines. And if we're too busy pursuing something, then there's no room for anything to land. So to clean up and clean out the garage inside our head in our physical space, I think, is really important. And then to give ourselves pause to, again, you know, consciously uh, petition for insight. Um, of course, the human mindset says, well, you're wasting your time. Just think of what you could be doing if you actually spent time in pursuit. Yeah, I get that, but that's, that's flawed thinking. That's fear-based survival instinct is what that is. So again, we see the, the boogeyman inside our reflexes to uh, always proact on something out of fear rather than to expose ourselves to possibility, which is a skill that we have to learn to be able to apply. It, it, to me, you know, that's a much more or uh, Joe, that's a much more direct way to information rather than going the circular route through books, places, and things. And I'm not saying that those are inappropriate because they're essential, but I'm just saying that, you know, in, unless we learn that skill, I think we uh, use way too much energy in pursuit of something which blocks us. It creates almost a myopia or a hyperfocus and a lot of tension to try to get somewhere too quickly just to feel better about ourselves. And that's not, you know, when you want relief, that's not a time necessarily to take action. That's where we should maybe pause it, it, and again, uh, petition for that insight to be able to show up. It's a, all the prolific achievers, they, they know that, you know, and it seems inconceivable to the human mind that that's true, but it, it actually happens to be a fundamental skill that's uh, essential if you're gonna be a serial success in what you do. It's a, you know, a more articulate and elegant way of saying what I refer to when I'm saying a calling. So mm. thanks for elaborating on that, Jeff. Yeah. You mentioned uh, the shower, Jeff. Yeah, the shower, yeah. <laughs> a couple of years ago, I discovered that I would get really great ideas in the shower. And I thought, okay, how do I double down on this? And I actually created a 
um, a, a process that I do every morning now where I take 20 minute showers. Like even when we found this house, one of the top things I told the agent, the shower has to be freaking epic because I do this thing. And uh, um, what I'll do is I'll, before I go into the shower, I'll think of uh, a question I have or a problem I want to solve or an idea I want to just let go of. And I get in the shower and I clean myself quick and then I'll just spend 10 minutes connected and I get plugged in to source or, or, or whatever it is. And every single time I get the most amazing downloads. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know what to call this thing or label it. Like, like I actually wanted to bring this up today and thank you for talking about showers, Jeff, because I wanted to ask Philip about intuition and also to bring up what, what I believe you call soul set. So first of all, what is soul set? And Philip, what is happening to me in my shower? <laughs> Well, I didn't never thought for one second you and I'd be talking about showers and what goes on in showers and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> but um, soul set to me is is essentially the the I suppose more the emotional landscape, and it's and it's and it's it's a it's a it's a, an attempt to get out of our head and start to to feel in the world today. Um, I, I've, I'm seeing a, a pattern ever increasing with 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 individuals I'm, I'm talking to and working with, whereby they have. I mean, I can I can spin this in multiple different directions. It could be a book that they're thinking of writing. It could be a speech or it could be a business. And typically there's three doors, typically. And there could be a fourth in the distance. There is what they're doing right now. There's what they think they should do. In other words, the book they, they think they should write, the book that they think they sh that will sell. And I'm always deeply intrigued by what's door three. So I had a situation yesterday with an individual and he basically we're chatting about his business and he has this desire to move geographically within within the states and option one is he moves and leaves his business in the city option two is he brings his business with him and the reason he, he wants to do that is so he can eradicate the guilt of being out of state and this residual guilt that he has about not being the custodian or the steward of this business and I was about to move on until I just kind of found myself going, he's bullshitting himself and he's, he's bullshitting me as well. And I just said, let's just say, and, I, and there's only one way I, I, I said, you're not allowed to do option one. You're not allowed to do option two. What would you do? And he, he doesn't even have to think about it. He goes, oh, no, I'd sell the business. And, he, and it was like, not just did he say I'd sell the business, but he literally, I'm not exaggerating, he, he, I think he lost probably five years maybe seven years on his face instantaneously. And then you could just see him. He looks up and the next minute, then the, what will people say? And what about my family who are in the business? And then, and then his face crunched up again. And he goes, yeah, I, I just don't think that's the responsible thing to do. And I just said, great. And I'm sure it's not. And, and, I, and I often say to people, well, who's that speaking? Put a name on that voice. And there's always one person. But I bring him back and I just, I want to bathe in what I feel is that intuitive longing that he has to offload his business, not because it's a bad business, but he was never destined to own a business. He's a, he's a, I don't know how you describe this guy. He's a, like a, I won't even get into it in case I give him away, but he's not, this is not as this is not his path. This is not as as Neil says his calling. It's just not. And because he doesn't understand what his calling is, he stays with what he knows and what society say he's good at. And one other thing I'd like to elaborate, and I'd love to hear the guy's opinion on this, is this idea somebody said the other day. Oh, this work is hard. The work that you do, this exploration work that you guys do, this is hard. I said, no, it's not hard. I'll tell you what's hard. What's hard is not doing it. What's hard is not doing it. It's not that hard. And I think the challenge, and, 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 and I love, and thank you, Neil, for sharing that story. I, you know, I, 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 I've been broke and badly broke. But I never had to open the fridge and see nothing. But... I think people are going around and they think the pain is not bad enough. And I think the pain is tremendous, but they've become so used to absorbing the pain. My mother has severe arthritis through her shoulders and her hips. And not just does she not complain about it, unlike me, if I was a patient, I'd be a disaster. But she wants to protect me 
and her family from the pain she's in. So if I asked her today, how's your pain, mom? She'd go, Philip, it's, no, I'm fine. It's okay. And she's popping painkillers. And if we could get a probe where I could put it in her hip and I could put the same probe on the other side of it into my hip and I could experience what she's experienced even for 10 minutes, I'm telling you right now, I don't think I'd be able to walk, maybe not even breathe. I think it's that bad. But because she's numbing it and because it's progressively got worse and worse and worse, she's she's gotten used to living with that pain. And I think we're we're in a lot more pain because we're disconnected from ourselves and the work we're meant to do and the places we're meant to live, the conversations we're meant to have. And we're, we're not taking the space to allow that pain to emerge, which is an odd thing to present or to, to throw this idea, to allow the reality of the life we're living to emerge, to hit us in the face, to feel the anger, to feel the sadness. And then, as Neil faced on the other side of it, that pivotal moment where shit's going to change. I think a lot of that is uh, being able to inform them of the first step, because if you have a first step that you know, sometimes that's all you need. If you keep people in the game long enough to just have that first little step of success and all of a sudden they see possibility. But sometimes I think they make the process way too big or they try to take on too much too quick. I mean, everybody's told to figure out what your moonshot is and how you're going to influence a billion people. I mean, that's kind of where things start, right? I think it maybe should be pruned back a little bit to you know, what's the most important step you could take, the smallest step that you can do that confirms to you that you have made progress. I mean, a lot of it's just you know, starting the process. And once you've done that, then the snowball starts to run downhill a bit. Yeah, certainly, certainly for me, that moment that I talked about, that pivotal moment for me, <clears throat> I had no idea what that was going to look like. No idea. And... You know, I, I, I'm someone, I, I like to pretend that I'm making, I'm the one making choices and decisions and responding and what's the responsible thing to do and what's aligned with what I'm up to, like that live forward mentality. But without exception for me, when I get further down the track and look down the other end of the telescope, it always looks like there's been divine design that's, that's shaped those things that have unfolded in alignment with what I believe that I was meant to do. And Giovanni, your thing about the shower, it's really interesting to me how often uh, people have these moments in uh, where their physical environment uh, is a space of nurturing, oftentimes smaller environments, darker environments, oftentimes involving water or soothing touch. Um, I, I feel that there's almost like a real world recreation of a womb state where, you know, I mean, we've, we are just in such a state of creativity and growth and, and the, you know, the creation of a, a human being. And those replications of that in our real world, we, I think we oftentimes underestimate <clears throat> the power and the importance of the physical environments that we surround ourselves in and the way it can contribute to us finding alignment. Philip, I heard a story once, or like a, an analogy, of a man visiting a friend, the friend sitting on his porch in a rocking chair. His dog is on the porch with him. And as the friend comes closer, he hears the dog whimpering like, and he's like, that's so strange. And he asked the owner, what's wrong with your dog? And he said, oh, he's, he's sitting on a nail. He's like, why doesn't he move? And, and the owner says, it, it doesn't hurt enough yet. And I feel like that happens to so many of us. But in, in your case, even with the person you just described, Philip, what, what are the questions we have to ask ourselves to figure out what, what is actually happening? Like, like you know, the story of your mom we've become so accustomed to the status quo or the pain or, or the bullshit of our comfort zones that we don't even realize there's an option, that there's a different thing. Like I remember um, I used to have terrible vision where I couldn't see distance and I, I would wear glasses to drive and I got so used to that. And then I had the courage to have laser eye surgery um, around 10 years ago. And it, I swear to God, it felt like a miracle. Like if you've ever experienced this, I feel like I'm bionic, like, or I'm a, I'm a superhero now that I have bionic vision and I wouldn't have known the difference until after I go through the process. And I feel like so many of us are in this place where we don't realize there's a contrast anymore. How do, how does somebody figure out that they're in the bullshit if they don't know the contrast? If I take my mom for, for, as an example, um, she would need to suspend taking painkillers for a couple of days to understand how much pain she's actually in. And I think there is this reality in life, unfortunately, with the human psyche that 
we need to get in touch with the pain. We need to shine a line, light on the pain or we need to have someone help us do that. And I was at a conference once, there was about 600 people in the room and a guy put up a hand and his energy, the way he asked the question, told me everything I needed to go to know. And he said, well, okay, let's say you, let's just say you, you know, realize that you're in the wrong job or the career or you're not doing work that, that fires you up. Then, you know, what would you do differently? And, and, and it was kind of flippant. And it was one of these moments where he was trying to catch me out. And I said, I said, are we talking about you or are we talking about a friend? Because I'm not going to do the friend thing. I want to just, I want to, if this is a question from you, I'll, I'll entertain it. And he said, yeah, it's about me. And I said, well, I said, with respect, I said, I don't think the pain's bad enough, to which he got quite angry and, and pretty much said, you don't know me. How can you make an assumption the pain's bad enough? And I went out on a limb and I, and I said, well, let's, let's, if I'm wrong, I'm, I'll retract it and I'll apologize. How long? Have you been in this role and how long have you known? And he said, I, I believe, I can't remember exactly, but he, he said something like 15 years. And I went, excuse me? He said, 15 years. I said, sorry, my, my hearing's really bad, which it's not. And he said, 15 years. And there was literally one of those moments, and not because of me or anything, it was just like people are, oh, because this is a, a guy who was unwilling to go there, was asking a, if I had a friend question initially, energetically, et cetera. And I looked at him and I said, the pain is, is not, I knew the pain wasn't bad enough. He hadn't gotten to that place. He had chosen not to see it. And I chose to go a different way. And sometimes by using children, hopefully in a respectful way with, with good intentionality, you can begin to awaken somebody to something in their own lives. And I said, have you got children? He said, yeah. I said, give me the name of one of your children. And let's just say he said, John, I can't remember, but I said, let's fast forward when John is 25 or John is 35 or John is 45. And he comes to you. If he does, he may not, but he comes to you and he goes, dad, I'm in this job and it's miserable and it's killing me. What would you say to him? And again, didn't have to think about it. He goes, oh my God, you, you deserve more. You, you, did, you did you this, you know, you just get out of it. I could, you know, if you find something great, but if you don't, just get out. It'll be okay. I'll support. We'll work it out. And I said, well, here's the challenge. That son may not come to you because he may not have grown up in a house where he witnessed his father putting that value on himself. And I think it comes back to self-worth and value. And our second is he sees you being that hero taking a risk, taking that step. One, he'll go to you because you did it before. Two, he may not even have to have the conversation because he grows up in an inspirational environment where he refuses to settle as he moves through life. And I looked over and there was tears pouring down this man's face. And I believe in that moment and I cannot, I don't know what happened. I'd love to tell you he changed and everything else worked out. I don't know but I know for certain that he was in relationship with his reality in a different way for the first time in that moment. Wow. You mentioned children. I think, well, we all have kids um, and uh, raising my son and now our, our, all three of our boys is always a, a, an interest, interesting adventure. And um, I'm curious based on, especially all of this conversation, is there, are there things we, not just the four of us, but anyone listening and watching, we can do now that would allow our kids not to have to go through what we went through or do they have to go through it? And part of this conversation, uh, Jeff, if with, with permission, I'd love for you to share the, the story of what you've been doing for the past, I don't know, decade with your daughter and and um tell that story because you, you shared it at one of our events and the entire room was moved um and maybe let's start with you sharing your daughter's story and then let's talk about us yeah. as parents yeah well thanks well uh we talked about calling uh earlier in our conversation which is really important to me and my wife and i got called to consider adoption which we did and i was 58 at the time five eight uh at the height of my career uh, literally at the height of my career you know, working with uh, U2 and Bono and doing all the Tour de France with Lance and being with Tiger and stuff. And uh, uh, we uh, ended up adopting a, a 10-year-old uh, from Colombia. And, uh, you know, uh, 
when we uh, went to Colombia and we spent six weeks, whether we brought her back to the United States or she became a dual citizen, I turned to my wife and I said, um, you know, you realize that she doesn't speak any English and we don't speak any Spanish. And I said, she's 10, she doesn't have any school. And she was raised as a criminal, a thief, a cheat and a liar. And she's got severe PTSD and ADHD from getting beaten up and physically abused since the age of four. And she's got a parasitic ridden body and every known risk factor to humanity is like a, a thousand on a scale of 10. I said, this is not gonna be easy, you know, and I'm used to dealing with, uh, you know, challenging people that are very precocious, you know, in the athletic entertainment and business world. So that was not unfamiliar to me and I, I knew what we were up against. And I, I said to my wife, it's like, look, you know, for us to be her parents, we welcomed her into our life. And I'm not the sort of guy that likes to chase a, a bronze medal. That's not my idea of fun. And I'm not in a hurry to win a, a silver medal. You know, I'm a gold plated sort of guy. That's just the way I am, you know, being an Olympian. And I said, uh, you know, for us to do this, you know, though I'm making a million dollars a year, I, I got to cut her income by 90% starting today to be her father. It starts today, which I was okay with. And so we, you know, kind of tightened the belt, should we say. And uh, uh, um, with that in front of us, my wife cried every day for nine years and 10 months. It was so difficult. It was like a million times harder than the Olympics. I mean, the Olympics was sort of easy. All you do is pedal faster than anybody else and you go. But in this situation, you know, it's, it's in the cosmic arm bar, man. I mean, if you want to cry uncle just because it's so unrelenting in terms of the difficulty. And the other thing I'll say is that, you know, my daughter did not ask for this. This was something that was imposed upon her, I mean, which is even worse. And so uh, what I, I learned from this and as we were enduring the, uh, the 10 years of uh, austerity at the highest level, should I say, we had a crew of at least a thousand people in my mind it felt like to deal with their psychologists there were psychiatrists there were medical doctors there were tutors there were sports coaches I mean it was it took everything that we had literally to do everything that had to go right to just keep her in the game and you know I was unwilling to forfeit like one millimeter forward progress for her by uh, uh, not being available to respond to her needs at any point in time and so I you know literally was working with a handful of people while I put myself in blackout mode uh, against my profession, which I was entirely okay with. Uh, and th the thing that I'll say here is that, um, you know, first off, what did I learn from this experience? I learned that you can love anybody. You just decide you're gonna do it. There doesn't need to be a reason behind it. You know, it isn't like you give to get or there's some payoff later. You don't think about things like that. It, as Neil said earlier, there's an inherent trust in process when you're called to something. And sometimes that's all you got because there is no visibility forward. Y you're Literally, you don't know where next is coming from only because the demands of now are so significant and overwhelming. Um, you know, trust and process, and you can love anybody. You just decide you're gonna do it, you know? And the other side of this too is that uh, there's always enough energy to do anything on behalf of anybody. Uh, the energy consumption is always excessive when everything's in our own self-interest based upon our own fear and needing to hoard just to feel a little bit better about ourselves. And I would also say that another key side to this is that you have to really decide, to me the most important question every day is how are you gonna show up? Because you know my daughter didn't deserve the people that imposed themselves on her physically. I mean, you can see scars on her body where they you know, beat her with a baseball bat. I mean, it's, it's heart wrenching to, to, to see the scars, you know, both you know, emotionally and physically. But you don't give up. You stay in the game and you find a way. That's what champions do. You don't, you don't decide you're going to do your best. You decide you're going to find a way. I mean, that's why we're given brain, body, mind, spirit, ingenuity, curiosity, creativity, is to find a way forward, you know, because it's always going to be there. And I also uh, learned that, you know, number one is that you never withhold the possibility of a miracle. You got to hold that sacred, you know, and hold ground for that. And so after 10 years, uh, when my daughter um, graduated from high school and her family never graduated from elementary school, um, when she finally graduated from college, that was our, our moment of clarity that uh, we got her miracle. Uh, it's the most important experience of my entire life because when she used to wrap her legs around me and bury her head into my chest and hug me, she'd never been hugged before. And you see that you know, she's hanging on me every word and it's up to me to find the language to say what needs to be said to her to keep her in the game. And I said to her three things. 
you know, in broken English. There are several things that I did here I think that are important, if, if I may. Is I said, number one, you're always going to have enough to eat because she didn't have enough to eat. She told me that she used to pick gum off the bottom of seats and, and chew it to stave off the hunger pains or pick the gum off the street to eat and stave off the hunger pains. You know, so I promised her you're always going to have enough to eat. And that's why she stole partly be, to, to feed herself. And I said that, you know, I'm never going to let you down because her family, her country, everybody let her down. I was not going to do that. It's not me to begin with. It, it wasn't going to happen. But I also told her, you know, you deserve every break that humanity has to give. But you know what? You got to earn your place on the team because I just knew that, you know, no free gifts to her because it would have been a disservice to her. And that was a little bit hard to say and to do, but we did it. And, uh, you know, with that, I can say that, uh, you know, she's just the most beautiful human being possible. And the other thing I would say to anybody, please, we've been talking about gifts here. I would say never discount the uh, power that you believe your gifts to have by comparing with others, because the fact is you don't know. You know, you don't, you don't know who's watching. You don't know who's listening. But wherever you are, the proximity of your presence of being is saying something to everybody in your proximity. And so I feel that if we do find the, the gifts that uh, we are born with, and sometimes it takes a while to get there, and we put our full weight behind the uh, development uh, of those as a good steward, then our life starts to have a, a certain level of, of meaning, and we develop a certain amount of uh, invincibility, should I say, because, you know, we're not trapped or we're not bound to the usual scorecard stuff that most people think that are important because most of it's not. Most of it is really about what do we think about ourselves and do we trust our ability to make good decisions? Can we hold our own in the presence of adversity? Can we be the person and the friend that people deserve us to be? And when we show up from that place and we have this and our beacon speaks brightly and those people that, uh, need to be in our presence. We don't even know who they are, but, but they'll get the message. And that's what I've learned from that. And every day you decide who you're gonna be when you show up. And we talked a little bit about who is the real me. And I feel the real us is the one that chooses to show up from a place of dignity and uh, shows up with the sole intent to give the best that we can give to anybody without any expectation of reciprocity. You know, that's the real us. The not us is a sniveling whiner that wants everything and plays the poor me game. You know, and our best therapy against ourselves is to be able to stand up and show up and be that uh, champion within us that I described earlier in our conversation. And, uh, um, you know, I, I think that's all I had to say, actually. So somebody give me a clean, a, like a Kleenex so I can clean the tears off my eyes here. Yeah. 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 Uh on that, Jeff, you know, on on talking about parenting and possibility, I, I think that very very few things affect yeah. children more than the unlived lives of their parents. And you know, for, for children to to believe, truly believe that yeah. anything is possible, it, it it has to be modelled. And uh, as a parent, if you're going to preach possibility, you know, always in all ways, for sure you have to do it in how you live not in what you say and uh and i think you are the gold standard mentor and representative of that yeah uh it's extraordinary what you've contributed oh, to your daughter you, i know you and i've had opportunities well, to talk about you. this in more detail Easy in the past and you are my hero man i i love the story jeff thank you um i i think there's a number of things i remember a number of years ago somebody um, it was actually Derek, um, Derek Coburn um, in Washington, uh, Geo, I think you know him, maybe the rest of the guys do as well. And I remember him putting a post out on Father's Day to all the most, to all the amazing fathers in the world. I know when my name was on it, and, and I think for maybe, I was going to say 10 seconds, but probably a good, maybe hour, my ego shot into, into play and it was just like, oh my God, wow, look, I'm a, I'm a great father. And Derek said that, so it must be true. And then I found myself asking this question, finally, the question I didn't want to ask, and that was, do I feel like a good dad? And the answer, the answer to that question essentially was no. And the admission from that was I often give my, my, my clients more patience and attention than I do my own family. This is a number of years ago, and it's improved and changed somewhat, but it's still worked, worked, worked to, uh, to be done. And... 
I think the other couple of things that as a, as a, as a, as a, as a parent, it's just not to assume that often I meet parents to say I'm a nine out of 10. It's just to, you know, whether it's negative thinking or not, I don't know, but I often say, no, I'm a five. I'm pretty much always a five because I, there, there, there has to be more possibility and, and, and opportunity to create space and, and, and to be more present and caring and loving, et cetera. The other side of it is that I, I have a piece of parenting advice and maybe it's not advice and it's kind of arrogant and it's kind of crude, but it, it's designed that way to make a point that no matter what you do in life, you're going to screw your kids up. And what I mean by that is it's, it's an opportunity to let go because I think we hold too tight. We, we hold our children too tightly sometimes and we want to live often through them and want to create a life for them and everything else. And I think if we can accept the fact that our kids will probably need therapy, that we can't prevent that, nor should we prevent that, I think it lets go of the responsibility on being the perfect parent. I, I believe it's done a lot for myself, my wife, this idea that no matter what we do, we are, they are going to have challenges. At the same time, it does not mean we don't show up for them every single day. And um, yeah, there's a few things that 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 are working for us or not working for us, as the case may be, or they at least they appear to be in some in some regards. I have this book with me here, Philip. Can you see? <laughs> this was the journal from one of your events, and in here it says, "quote Philip says we are always fucking up our kids," um, and I'll never forget that lesson. And yet, at the same time, my original thought from all of this was, can we help them? avoid the pain that we've been through or do they need to experience their own painful events like part of i i believe a lot of the stuff we've all been through shapes us but then none of us want our kids to be in pain so what what is the balance there of of allowing them to get hurt and worrying like crazy about that and then letting go of that fear to give them their own experience that's something I personally battle with, and I'm curious to get any of your feedback. No, no one escapes, right? I mean, no, no one escapes life. No one. Uh, we develop all sorts of uh, skills and public presentations to minimise uh, to what extent we ha we we haven't escaped life. But you know, human beings live in, uh, for the most part, some degree, oftentimes to a, a significant degree of pain. No one's going to escape. And I think as a parent, what is the, the very best that we can do as parents is just what we believe. It doesn't even matter whether, whether you, it is the right answer. The pursuit of thinking the right answer is problematic. The very best you can do is just what you believe is the right thing to do. You won't even know. We, we, we learn retrospectively as parents. It's later on when we look back and say, oh, maybe I could have or maybe I should have, which has little value unless it gives us an opening for the future. But at the end of the day, the very best that you can do is what you believe is in their best interests. That is the best you can do. So the idea of trying to turn that now into prescription, you know, love your children. What the, what the heck does, does... That gives nobody any opening whatsoever. People don't need advice. They need the right questions. They just need the right questions, as do children. You know, mine are now 34, 36, 38. I don't give my kids advice. They ask me, what, I, I, what should I do in this situation? And I'm, I listen, and I listen closely. And m m the way I interact with their questions, more so now than ever before, I find myself saying, gosh, I, I get what you're saying. What should I do, Dad? Well, given your best win wisdom, given your best level of insight, what do you think would be the best thing to do? They'll come back. Well, what do you think about that? I can see you're thinking this, this through. Is, is there an alternative to that? I'm asking them questions constantly. I'm not giving them advice because they, they're going to have to figure out that model, that structure of just coming to trust that, look, at the end of the day, all you can do is what you believe is best. And later on, you're going to have a judgment about that. But if you're doing what you believe is your best, then you're doing your best. Can I ask a question of, um, of, of uh, maybe I love all of your insights in this. Um, I, it might have even been the one last talk event, Gio, that you spoke at, but the, I met a 15-year-old young man called Matt, and he came up to me at the, at the event, at, at the very end of the event with his, with his dad, 
And for context, you know, about eight or maybe 10 adults over two days, men and women had given their one last talk. So they were quite vulnerable, et cetera. And I looked at Matt and I said, Matt, what's your takeaway from this? After sitting in this room for two days, what's your takeaway? And he said something really, really simple, but quite profound. He said, it's great to know that adults have problems too. <laughs> that was the one. Yeah. What was fascinating, I'd love your opinion or insights into this or just what, what comes up for you around this. But the last thing I'll share is what was really amazing was his father was standing next to him just went. And, 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 and I just thought it was really, really, really insightful. I just love to throw that on the table and just, just see what comes from that. Phil, let me add something to that. You know, I, um, I, I met my wife. She had just turned 12. I'd just turned 13 over 50 years ago. You know, it's com coming up towards to 19,000 days, 18,696 days ago. We have the most extraordinary relationship. She's incredible. She is just an angel on earth. And one of the things that we loved as parents was, wow, our children grew up in an environment where they, they never saw an argument, they never saw a fight, not because we protected, it from, protected them from it, it's just we don't argue, we don't fight. We just have this uniquely high degree of satisfaction in, in our relationship. I absolutely scored the better end of, of, of the deal. Like She's just extraordinary. But we also believe that, wow, isn't it great if what we can model for our children is that we are people that are, that are committed to being polite to one another, courteous to one another, appreciative of one another, grateful for one another. We say please, we say thank you, I open a door for her, I'm kind to her, all of those things that I, would, I, would, that I feel were modelled to me by my parents and it's like that's precisely what I want for my kids, that's what I want them to experience. Now, none of my three kids are married. One of them went through a complex marriage and no longer is in marriage. My middle son and my daughter, two of my three kids have come and said, Dad, it's created a problem for us. You set the bar too high. Every time we're out with somebody, we compare them to you. And that's what we want and that's what we're looking for, but I can't find that. And I'm like, wow, that was, this is not what I wanted. This was not what I intended. I thought it would be different than that. I thought it would help them navigate their way to finding that, that in their lives. And I look at them in their 30s. I've had my wife in my life, essentially all my life, and I know, you know, life's tough. And to be able to just have somebody you can go through the ups and downs and the peaks and plateaus and, and the breakdowns and with the financial wipeouts and all the problems of building a, an international business and all of that issues and bringing three children and living on the other side of the world, to have that partnership and be able to have our children see you can have an extraordinary companion and friendship through that whole journey. But then for them, they experience it as it, that is what is precluding them from it. I'm not saying that's true. That's, I'm just saying that that's how they see it and articulate it. I'm not even sure the point that I'm wanting to make, but at the end of the day, for me, what we thought we were doing and what we thought it would result in has not been what it's turned out to be. It's fascinating because um, for me growing up, uh, and Neil, you know my parents. Uh, well, you met my mom. They they were heroes to me in terms of relationship. Like they're now in their late sixties and still go on dates and still talk about sex all the time and still are madly in love with each other. And they never fought, but they. Or sorry, they never fought in front of my sister and I. Any kind of conflict was done privately, and that was a challenge and maybe even messed me up because now I don't like conflict because I've never been modeled with how to deal with it versus probably other people where maybe their parents fought all the time and they just have different ways of coping or uh, like different challenges that come from that and yet um, a different experience. And I feel like th this is the question I'm always asking myself. It's how do I lead by example and at the same time realize I don't own my kids or my son or, or uh, they don't belong to me. They're their own individuals, their own people, and they're going to be on their own journey and, and deal with that. And that, that's, that's what I'm always thinking about. Yeah. Well, that's where no one escapes, right? And that's where their inter interpretation of your intent can be entirely different than your intent of their interpretation. They still got to show up from you. That's the best you can do. 
as Neil said earlier. You know, as right. long as you're authentic and you have a cosmic sign off on, on you, then that's the best that you can do for sure. Yeah, yeah c- because if you don't do, do yeah. that, then you're always going to walk away wondering what you could have done better. That that isn't almost a fair question, in my opinion. You know, if you've really taken the time yeah. to vet your presence of being when you do or act in a certain way and you don't know it to be true for yourself because there's not the conviction that this is inauthentic or inappropriate. That, as Neil said, that that's the best that you can do for sure. Neil, as you descri- as you described your relationship with your wife, I I, I I think we're all just smiling from ear to ear and, and, and it's just such a, a lovely thing to hear you describe your wife in such a, such a beautiful way. And, and I'm just curious about something you said, you know, what we were doing, we didn't have that intent. It feels to me as you were describing, it's just this is the way we're being. This is the way we were. We weren't trying to create an environment to have an, an, an outcome at the end, which I think actually often is the opposite for most parents. They're trying to create an incubator. They're trying to create an environment because they're looking for a particular outcome. And, and it feels to me, with, 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 without getting too personal, but you know, maybe it's a, it's a, it's a burden and, and I obviously you could feel the energy from, from you around it, that it's not what you intended. But I think as Jeff is right is, is I, I don't think you did your best. I, I don't think that's the right term for it. I think you did, you showed up extraordinarily. And I would go as far as to say, not to try to, to, to take away any discomfort or pain or, or anything you have, but the burden maybe you carry around this, but I would go as far, and I've never said this, so it might make. Com- I would say, a, a, somebody, a single person who doesn't settle, will ultimately ha- be happier, I believe, in their own skin than somebody who decides to be in an intimate relationship because they feel that they need to journey this world with somebody. They they don't feel whole, and that a poor relationship, no reflection on the individual, but a pure relationship together, uh, is going to get them across the line. I, I, and my experience is that's just not true. Um, so, so I, I commend you for the way yeah. you and your wife were being, um, and 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 trust that it'll it'll work it'll work out the way it's meant to. Yeah, because you know if you hold on to the steering wheel too tight, then you, you know the fear that you exude from that because it's your own fear that's doing that. The, the kids are going to pick up on that, and they're going to be really confused. You know, there has to be. Yeah, it's really nice. Before we end, yeah. Thank you, Neil. Can I ask you to share your ritual with Hunter, your wife, in terms like what what you do before you leave the room or before you leave to go out? Yeah. Uh, well, just to set a bit of context, the the familiarity that we have in our relationship, you know, coming together as friends when she just turned twelve and I've just turned thirteen. So we've essentially been in each other's life, pre-teens, through teenage years, pre-adolescence, adolescence, adulthood, getting married, being in business, three children, moving to the other side of the world. That, I, don't, I don't really know a life without my wife. And so it creates uh, a relationship culture of an extraordinary degree of familiarity and ease and comfort that we have around one another. And sometimes that ease and comfort, as comfortable and, and as easy as it is, it oftentimes doesn't give us access to the, to the conscious awareness of how profoundly and deeply we love each other. And some time ago, we were looking at what is it that we could do that would reset and, and, and keep us in touch with our love for one another. And <clears throat> although we're both aware of that, how it would look in the mornings, for example, I'd hop out, up out of bed, do whatever I'm doing, I'm in the shower, Hunter walks by, hey darling, hey, what are you doing today? Oh, I've got this, I've got that on, okay, great. Hey, look, I've got to go, okay, bye love, see you, you know, kiss on the cheek. And it's like there is a world of difference between saying love you and I love you. They are very different things. So I thought, wow, wouldn't it be great if, if I could actually set that up as a part of our relationship? So, to, so that in the morning, it's not, hi, darling. 
in, in the morning, it's can I hold her face? And can I look her in the eye and connect with truly how I feel, the depth of the gratitude that I have for her, the love that I have for her, the respect and the appreciation and the gratitude that I have for her? Can I connect with that? And can I say that to her in just a simple sentence? Can I encapsulate all of that in I love you and thank you for everything you are for me? Can I say that briefly and, and mean it? So that she, so that it lands with the intent that I have of her experiencing the gratitude and the love and the respect and the appreciation that I have for her. And when I'm, when I'm walking out the door, it's not by love, it's can I hold her and can I grab her and hug her and in that hug, can I transmit my, that appreciation of like, you are just me, you are a part of me and we are one. And can I hold you that way and that you feel it in that moment? <clears throat> And I found that whatever the energy was, the quality of the energy that I left home with was the exact same quality that I would walk in the door with. And so when I came in the door, it wasn't, hi, how was your day? It's can I put my bag down and likewise kiss her on the face, kiss her on the lips, look her in the eye and it's like, hey, I'm back and I'm back with you and I'm just so grateful that I have that opportunity. We hop into bed and the first thing that we do is we are in each other's arms. There are all sorts of ways of making love, all sorts of ways. And the most important thing for me is in those moments, can I, can I hold her in my arms and can I just touch her body? And in my touch, can I bring the love and the respect and the appreciation so that she feels that I'm conscious of and, and I value how I feel about her? And it has allowed us to not only have the familiarity and the comfort and the companionship and the ease, but it keeps us both very present to this extraordinary depth of love that we have for one another. You know, the sort of love that near impossible to tolerate. It's so perfectly divine. It's a simple practice. If you add it up, it takes about 90 seconds a day. And it absolutely has transformed the quality and experience of our relationship. I take back what I said. Your sons are screwed, and so am I <laughs> after this. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking. Beautiful. Guys, we'll, we'll end here. Thank you so much for today's conversation. One of the coolest parts about this show and this uh, conversational format is that we get to treat every guest as a recurring character on a TV show. So you're all three invited back. Every time you come back, you're going to be with two other different people and we're going to have a different conversation. It's going to be epic. And I love all three of you. I appreciate you so much. Thank you so much for today's conversation. And this is just the beginning of this journey. Thanks, Giovanni. Philip, Jeff, love you all. Thanks, guys. Back at you, Gio. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Philip. Be well. Big luck. Now you have your true identity aligned, it's time for you to design your dream life. For there is another world out there that you have not yet seen. A world you never thought you'd be part of. One that you told yourself you don't belong. I'm here to tell you that you, my hero friend, are worthy of it. Are you prepared to see the other side? See you next time, as our next set of guides will show you how to create your dream life.